Okay, so welcome again to the first uh, edition of our Solid Edge monthly training. Today we're going to talk about uh, some of the basics of creating and manipulating planes and sketches in Solid Edge with synchronous technology and then creating those synchronous base features and how to use them. So uh, again, this is, gonna, this is being recorded. It'll be posted on our YouTube channel uh, and those of you that have signed up for this course uh, will receive the um, training material, the activity files in advance. Uh, you'll also be able to kind of give some input as to what you'd like to see in future training sessions. So plain sketching and base features. This is about as basic as we're going to get in these courses. Uh, and uh, for some of you who are um, already using synchronous technology, you may have known this stuff already, um, but you'll probably find some decent tricks too. And for those of you completely new to uh, history-free modeling or even the 3D CAD in general, this is a great place to start. So I want to start this discussion with uh, kind of just some background theory of synchronous technology. I, I know you guys hear this a lot, especially from, uh, from Siemens and from us, but this is kind of a, a succinct way to describe the theory behind synchronous technology, why we have it. So I've just got my solid edge window opened up here. And uh, let's take go back in time for a second, back into when 2D... CAD was sort of new. And the way that CAD was created, geometry was created in 2D back then, was to start at a point, your 0, 0, and then create a line by actually keying in a length, let's say 4 inches, and then an angle, 90 degrees, and hitting enter. And there I've got my line. Now I continue going on, maybe I want one at 1 inch, at 0 degrees, hit enter. And you can kind of keep doing this three inches at 270 degrees. And you can see I'm constructing geometry as I go. Let's do another three inches, zero degrees, one inch at 270. And then back the other way, we'll do four inches at 180. And now I've created that piece of 2D geometry. I mean, this was, this was sort of um, 2D CAD in, in one of its earliest incarnations. And, uh, and, and it was sort of keyed in inputs. Uh, this is still familiar to anybody using um, uh, you know, AutoCAD or, or even in Solid Edge. I mean, as I said, we've got this, this technology still right here. Now, later on, what was introduced was parametrics. And that was where the idea was, rather than kind of key it all in as you go, you sort of create your, the rough um, shape that you want in 2D. And then once you have that, you can add dimensions to further refine that. So we said we wanted four inches there, maybe um, one inch here. And then this enabled us to add s different types of intelligence. So for example, an equal command would set these two edges equal to one another and hold that so that when I adjusted this dimension, the other one would change too. Now in the end, we end up with the exact same thing once we put in all of our dimensions. But we have some added flexibility here in that we could get the shape out and then refine it with the dimensions. You know, furthermore, as things change, I can use these handles and kind of you know, make these changes as I go along. And this was a big leap for 2D CAD to be able to do this. Now, let's draw a parallel with 3D CAD. And I'm going to open up um, a part that's been modeled in, in what we refer to in Solid Edge as ordered modeling. And ordered modeling has basically been the bread and butter of the 3D CAD world uh, for a long time. And there's a good reason for that. It, it's very predictable, reliable, it's um, straightforward, and, and with the right series of steps you can create anything. But that's kind of the point here, is that there are steps. So if I kind of flip through the features that we use to create this part, you know, we start off with this profile that's been extruded out, and that's the first feature we have, and then we add features. We cut material away, we punch holes or put radii through there, and sort of one after the other, we create this geometry kind of stacked on top of one another. And that's basically how 3D CAD has worked for, for, for 20 years now. And it's, and it's it, as I said, it's been a great technology. But let's look at one of the shortcomings of this. If you think about this, we just drew a parallel between you know, a coordinate-based 2D drafting and history-based modeling. And part of those, the limitation we're going to see is, let's say, through the design process, um, my manager comes in and tells me the distance between this hole and this hole now has to change. Right now it's 38 millimeters, but we need that to be 
uh, 50 millimeters, let's say. So I'll go, all right, not a problem, you know. Uh, he also says that, you know, try to keep this, uh, you know, we want everything on this side of the model to say to stay the same. So when you, when you change the distance between this hole and this hole to 50 millimeters, we really only want to move the features on this side. So I, I say okay, and I go in, and I, I have to roll back my history tree to that first step. And that's the profile of my base feature. And in this base feature, I've got dimensions that I can modify. You know, I can change this to anything I want. But the problem is, is that hole that I'm referencing that I want to make 50 millimeters isn't there yet. So that's not going to work. So let's go back to the drawing board. And again, I'll, I'll get out of that sketch. Uh, and you can see here that all of my features are um, rolled back. So when I hit finish, those will all regenerate. Now there's my hole. So maybe that's where I want to go into. And if I go in and edit its profile, we see that we've got a dimension that uh, dictates the placement of the hole. And I can put in another dimension between the hole and the uh, center point here where my other hole is on the other plane. But because this feature's already been created, I can't change that dimension. So in order to accommodate the request of my manager, I've kind of got to work backwards, do a bit of math, and we lose productivity in that process. So let's take a look at the same part now in synchronous technology. And I'll just go and recent documents. And this is the exact same part, but it's been modeled in synchronous. So, you know, same set of features, same steps to create this. The only difference now is that in the synchronous world, everything's happening live. So I can drop a dimension between that hole and this hole, just like my manager wanted. And there it is at 38. And because all of this is happening in real time, all I need to do is put a box around the geometry I want to move, which is all this stuff here, click on my dimension, and key in the value that I need that to be. So if you can kind of draw some parallels here, um, the difference between uh, synchronous and ordered is not unlike the difference between these two 2D drafting techniques we've got. This one, um, you know, you, you can create the geometry, but you're kind of a slave to, to the order in which you created things, not unlike synchronous. Whereas this technique, which we take for granted now, allows you a lot more flexibility and a lot more intelligence. Now, having said that, I, you know, I wouldn't go so far as to say any technique is superior to the other. You know, case in point, in Solid Edge, you can create 2D geometry by keying in coordinates and lengths and angles. And, and that's a perfectly good way to do things. Similarly, we still offer ordered modeling because in some cases it's the best tool. The point of synchronous technology is to give you one more tool and some added flexibility because at the end of the day, um, you've got a job to do. And if you've got enough weapons in your arsenal to do that, you're going to be the most effective and the most productive. And that's what matters at the end of the day. So having kind of illustrated the, the whole reason why we have this synchronous technology, let's take a look at what it's like to work in it. And I want to start by creating, you know, just simple sketch geometry on plane, which is the first step in any of these processes. So again, feel free to follow along. This is being recorded, so if you fall behind, um, you can view the recording. But I'm going to start by opening up um, a part file. And I, and I did the last one in millimeters. In this case, I, I'm opening it up in ANSI, so we'll be working in inches in this case. So first things first in synchronous technology. You want to make sure that here in the Pathfinder, you're in your synchronous mode. Um, and we're going to be using these sketching tools up here, which are in the Home tab, but they're also found over here in Sketching. And you get a little bit more detail when you go into here. So um, again, this, this, this lesson kind of uh, assumes that people are familiar with the Solid Edge interface. If you're completely brand new to Solid Edge, um, we've got some stuff on our YouTube channel. I'll be posting the link at the end of this. Uh, we've got one that just familiarizes you with the interface in our um, Intro to Solid Edge series. So uh, you know, if, if you want to take a step back and, and review that, by all means, because it, it'll at least get you oriented in, uh, in, the, in the user interface. So. Let's start by creating some 2D geometry. And in Solid Edge with Synchronous, you basically start by selecting what you're going to draw. In this case, I've selected a rectangle by center. And then you see that I've got kind of these green crosshairs that have appeared. And really, if I click once anywhere, that's going to create that center point of my rectangle. And as I drag it out, it'll, uh, it'll create that shape. 
Now, if we just kind of rotate my view, and just for people really new to this, I'm just going to put this up on the side here. Um, this is the cheat sheet that was sent to anyone who signed up for training, but it's basically a quick reference guide to moving and rotating with the mouse and the uh, control, um, or the shift control and alt keys. I'm using a, a 3D mouse right now, which is an even better way to do things, but you know, use this uh, if you if you get lost. So. I'm going to rotate out of plane, and we can see that that sketch that I created kind of lies on that front plane. If I go and pick something else, let's say a circle this time, you notice that my, my sketching has kind of reoriented. We can see that I'm kind of on uh, what would be the ZY plane now. And really that's just because that's what my view is closest to. If I kind of roll my view up so I'm looking kind of down, you'll see that my crosshair snap to that view. It's really going to whatever's the closest thing available. So I'll click to start my circle by center and just kind of drag it out. Now, just like I did before, um, we can key in that value. I'll just reach my mouse up here, and you can see in this command bar, uh, it's got a value that's already highlighted. So if I want this to be, let's say, 10 inches, I can click that, and it'll create a 10-inch hole. Now, go back to my select tool, which is neutral ground, and let's see what I've got. I've got a sketch on this plane here, and I've also got a sketch uh, on normal to that on this plane. So, uh, a couple of things to note about these sketches. Uh, the first one is that if you click over uh, an area, it highlights, and that's because it's, r it's ready to be extruded into a piece of 3D geometry. We're not there yet. The other thing you can do is you can click on just the edge of the sketch, and when you do that, you're going to get handle points. Now, a circle has two handle points. One of them is the center point, which is right here. The other one is this handle point, which will be somewhere along the radius. And basically, clicking and dragging these will allow you to either resize or move that uh, piece of sketch geometry. Similarly, if I click on a line, I get uh, two handle points, one on each corner. I've also got the line itself, which when you click and drag, will allow you to move the geometry normal to that line. So you should see your cursor turn into a little X or cross, and that indicates that you're over a key point. But the point is you want to click the line first to wake up those key points. All right, let's rotate my view once more to this side and go and pick uh, another rectangle, let's say. And I'll place a rectangle. Now you can see that I'm, I'm mostly oriented towards the ZY plane. So when I click and draw that piece of geometry, it's on the ZY plane. So I've got three different planes, three different sketches. And in fact, if we go back up to my select tool and reach up here into our property tree and expand sketches, you can see that we have three different sketches. And by mousing over them, each one will highlight. Now let's orient so we're kind of looking straight on here and let's draw just another piece of geometry. I'll click and draw another circle. Notice that as I draw that, it doesn't create another sketch, but it has indicated here that my sketch one is my active sketch. It's got a little pencil next to it. And that's because that it's adding any geometry that's on this plane to this group which is of geometry, which is sketch one. So what we're getting at here is that any pieces of sketch geometry that are drawn on the same plane will get grouped into that same sketch. Now. We mentioned that if you click on the edge of a sketch, you've got this ability to modify the shape by grabbing these handle points. The other thing we can do, if you look up here, we've got this with this with this edge highlighted. Up in my ribbon bar here, I have um, a bunch of parameters. Like there's my diameter of my circle. Um, you've also got this button stack here. And right now, we're set to modify, which is going to modify this circle. The other thing we can set it to is move. And what that's going to do is that's going to give us our steering wheel. And it'll allow us to move any of the selected geometry that we've got. In this case, remember, I clicked on the edge of that circle. So now it's going to allow me to move that circle. Now, the steering wheel uh, has a lot of functionality. And um, it's really worthy of its own um, lesson, which we'll be getting onto. But for now, all I want to do is I just want to highlight that major arrow, not the end point, but the major arrow. And you see it's barely visible there. but if I turn on my magnifying glass, um, you'll see that next to my cursor, it's actually giving me feedback that I'm going to initiate a move. 
And with this done, I can click and I can actually move this circle. And if we sort of change sides, what I'm doing is I'm actually moving it out of plane to a new plane, maybe a plane that's eight inches away. Now having done that, Notice what it's done. It's created a new sketch, sketch four, which on which this geometry now lies. So the point is, is that even though these were drawn on the same plane and grouped as sketch one, we can use that command to move geometry out to another plane, and it will group it into a new sketch because it now lies on another plane. So let's look at some other ways we can control what plane we're on. Um, up until now, we've sort of been manipulating our view and allowing our crosshair to sort of snap to any one of these normal planes. The other thing we can do is if we kind of come into this origin, if you, with a sketch tool already selected, in this case I'm in the line command, if I come over this area in here, you see that it's going to highlight a plane. And that's the plane formed by the Z and X uh, axes. Now I can kind of jump around and you can see that it'll find other planes defined by those. If you want to see these planes slightly bigger, we can turn them on up here in our Pathfinder, the base reference planes. And if anyone's used normal uh, or ordered modeling, these are typically on by default. So these are actually um, you know, representations of these planes. And, and they have a certain size, but they're in fact infinite in terms of um, how big they are. So that's what's happening behind the scenes, but with these planes kind of highlighting, you notice that I get this little lock symbol. And you also notice down in my prompt bar, which is the white bar that runs along the bottom of my screen, it's telling me that I can either click to, to create the first point of my line, or I can press F3 to lock the plane. So if I lock that plane by hitting F3 when I've got it kind of highlighted over my cursor, now no matter where I move my mouse, it's going to stay locked to that plane. You can also actually directly click on the little lock icon. But now notice that no matter where I turn my view, I'm always on that plane. Now let's go over here, and I can pick up on this geometry, and I'll just draw, clicking once to place the first point of my line and clicking again to end it, you see that it's got yet another line, and I'll just move it until I see that I'm connected to an endpoint here. And then it'll continue drawing lines until I hit right click or escape or go back to my select tool. And again, because we were locked to this plane now, you can see that I've got my indicator up here indicating that we're stuck on this plane. And also in my sketch stack, a little pencil next to, next to my active sketch, meaning any geometry I add to this will be on that sketch. So I can put, draw all kinds of things in here. Now let's talk about some of the things that we can do with this sketch geometry. Um, sketch relationships, these will be very familiar to anybody who's been modeling and ordered, but what these do is these help put a little bit more control over your sketches. So for example, I've got this um, triangular region here, and maybe I want to center the point of this over the center point of this um, rectangle here. So I'm going to use a horizontal vertical relationship, and I'm going to pick up on that end point, and then find the midpoint of this line. And when I see that there, I'll click it. And what it's going to do is it's going to line those two up together. Now, if you don't see this little alignment, you just want to look up here and make sure that relationship handles is turned on. With that off, you just kind of see your sketch geometry. You don't see the sketch relationships in the background. So you want to make sure that's on. You also want to make sure that maintain relationships is on. Otherwise, what you're going to get is kind of like AutoCAD data in that nothing will hold together. Because of these relationships now, if I click, let's say, this line and then try to drag that endpoint, it's going to move that sketch to maintain that relationship. Let's place another piece of geometry, again, still locked to that plane. And if you come on unlocked for whatever reason, maybe you've clicked on this lock button, just grab any sketch tool and just find that plane and hit F3 to lock it. Okay, so now I've got a circle here, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw that circle, and I'm just going to come along the bottom here, wait till I see that midpoint, and I haven't clicked to start my circle yet, but you'll see that your cursor kind of wants to stay in line there, and I'm going to click once, drag that cursor out, and notice it's automatically put a horizontal relationship in there. 
So now, no matter what I grab in here, it'll keep that circle centered on there. The other thing we can add is dimension. So I can put a dimension, and I'm doing a distance between, and I'll put that between the bottom edge of my rectangle and the center point of my circle. And let's set that to 1.5. Now, no matter what happens, that dimension will hold that. So slowly I'm kind of providing more and more control into my, um, into my sketch. So at any point now, I can select any one of these regions, click on it, and extrude that out. Now once I do that, you'll notice that my sketch goes away, but my dimension stays. And let's just take a look at what's happened here. We still have this sketch geometry, which wants to be a region, but now we have a piece of 3D geometry. I can click on any one of these faces and click this large arrow once, and that will move that back and forth. Now notice that my sketch which remains is still tied to there, but I'm now driving it by clicking on the faces. And this is kind of the theme of synchronous technology. The sketch is not driving the geometry. Once you create a 3D um, feature, that's totally on its own. In fact, the sketch that we use to create this feature is now down here in this little bin called used sketches. And if I expand that, we can see there's my sketch it's been consumed, but it no longer has any effect on my um, geometry. You see that I can click this dimension and change that dimension to move that, what's now become a hole. Maybe I'll key in two, but that doesn't have any bearing on the sketch, nor does the sketch in the background affect any of this, any of this um, uh, 3D geometry. Now, if I want to bring that sketch back, we can right-click on it and hit Restore. And that brings it back, and I'll just swing around to look at it from the other side, and you'll see that it brings it back as its own region that we can then reuse again and again, but it's not, no longer driving this piece of 3D geometry. Okay, I'm just going to click on that feature that I created and delete it, because I just want to focus a little bit more on some sketch geometry. Um, notice, too, that this... Uh, these two lines have become, they turn brown, indicating that they were constrained to something which is no longer there. And that's because when we created the protrusion, they inherited um, a relationship to those corners which no longer exist. So I actually don't need these anymore, so I'm just going to hold down Control, click both lines, and hit Delete. Now remember that anything I draw on this plane here will be added to what is called Sketch 1. We can override that by right-clicking on Sketch 1 and unchecking this Merge with Coplanar Sketches. What that means is that if I now draw on that plane, and again, I'll pick my rectangle, I'll move over to my front plane, lock the plane, and draw it. So I've drawn on the same plane as Sketch 1, but notice that it's created Sketch 6 now because we've toggled off that merging of, co of uh, coplanar sketches. So what this does is this allows us to um, create multiple sketches on the same plane. Notice, too, it also disabled those regions. I can't click in there, whereas in my new sketch 6, I can. That's another setting in here that we can turn on and off. So, for example, sketch 6, I can uncheck Enable Regions from here. So, a couple more things I want to show you um, in the sketch environment. Uh, one of them is IntelliSketch, and um, this is a, an option that I use quite frequently. It's over here in Sketching, and it's under IntelliSketch Options. We click on that. Um, one thing I want to start with anyways is the ability to automatically create dimensions for new geometry. Remember before, we kind of roughed this out and then placed dimensions in between. Uh, a feature I like to use is automatically create dimensions for new geometry, but only when geometry is created with a keyed-in value. What this does, and again, I'm still locked on my sketch plane here. If I were to draw a rectangle just by roughing it out, I don't get any dimensions on that. However, if I was to click to place my rectangle and key in that I want it to be 4, and I'll hit tab for my next dimension by 2, for example, and I'll hit tab again and put it at zero degrees. So we're, we're doing this kind of old school 2D drafting way, but it's a nice fast way to create things. If I do that, then it creates dimensions on that geometry, which I can then 
click an update. Now speaking of dimensions, the other thing we can do, and I'll click on sketch six, which is these three squares that I've drawn on this plane. One thing that we can do, I'm going to enable those regions so that I can extrude that out. I'm also going to right click and I'm going, you see that we can check or uncheck migrate geometry and dimensions. What this means is that if I extrude this region, it's going to bring those dimensions out with it. And these dimensions, I can now click and adjust. If I just hit undo a couple times and right click on that sketch and turn off migrate geometry with dimensions, now when I create that piece of 3D geometry, the dimensions are tied to the sketch, not the actual uh, 3D geometry. So that's another setting you can control whether or not you want to migrate your dimensions. And, and really, as we're going to see in synchronous technology, it's a good practice not to bring too many locked dimensions in. You're going to find that it's better to kind of, just like, just like in parametric um, 2D sketching, it's better to create the general shape of your part and then start dimensioning it once you have all the 3D geometry in place, which is kind of a, a vastly different way of thinking to traditional uh, 3D modeling. So, having gone through all that, I want to take us through actually modeling a part, uh, or at least creating some base geometry and then using sketches to add more geometry to that. And what we're going to create, uh, and I'll just jump back into my PowerPoint here, we're going to create that feature that we had at the beginning there, that, that part. So, let's use this applied knowledge uh, and go through and create this. So, I'll just move this over to the side here, and you gotta love Windows 7 for its uh, ability to dock planes, or to uh, uh, to dock uh, windows, just so we can see this uh, over on the side. And let's bring back up Solid Edge. Okay, so we got a lot of messy geometry here. Now we can go and actually delete stuff. You know, you can just box in and hit delete and delete anything you want. Uh, one thing people you might notice is that if you create a box and you accidentally catch your base coordinate system in there, if you hit delete, it'll delete everything but the base coordinate system and then tell you off for trying to delete the coordinate system. So you get that a lot sometimes when you're deleting things. In this case though, just because I've you know done a lot, I'm just going to close this without saving it and I'm going to open up a new part. And again, I'm going to do this in ANSI so we'll be working with um, imperial dimensions here. Okay, so let's take a look at this um, part here and decide how we're going to model it. And, and again, you know, in, in an ordered environment, there's a lot of rules to creating features and stuff. You're kind of less constrained in synchronous. You know, the idea is get that geometry there, make it roughly the right size, and then tweak those dimensions by putting putting dimensions between things uh, or pulling things into shape. Uh, the idea is that you know you may not necessarily know the exact end dimensions until you finish your design process. So let's start that off. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to um, IntelliSketch, which again is in your sketching ribbon right here, this little pencil with a light bulb over here in the IntelliSketch section. And I'm just going to turn off automatically create new geometry. I don't necessarily need to create dimensions for new geometry. And then I'm going to go to my rectangle by center. And because we're going to be doing a lot of um, drawing on this plane, I'm just going to mouse over till I see that plane between the X and the Y. And I'm going to hit um, F3 to lock. Now another good command that's going to come in handy is that sometimes it's a little bit awkward drawing on a plane but still looking at it in an isometric view. What we can do in this case is go to view and turn on your sketch view. Uh, this is kind of a handy technique uh, and it works in ordered or in traditional but what the sketch view will do is it'll just kind of once you have your plane locked it'll snap you into looking straight down. So let's try to get everybody on the same spot. And again, I'll just hit escape and get out of that and unlock my plane and show you again. I'm going to go to the um, rectangle by center. And I'm just going to kind of mouse around until I get that plane highlighted between the Z and the X. You might notice if you get to kind of too close in there, you might get other planes. We really want this one right here. That's kind of our front plane. And I'll just hit F3 to lock. And then I'm going to hit the sketch view, which is also control H, and that'll bring me looking straight on this. Now, uh, I want to kind of rough out the general dimensions of this, so I'm going to start 
by clicking this origin point once and that'll create the center point of my square and then I can kind of eyeball it or in this case I'm going to actually key in the dimensions and, and you can do that just by hitting numbers so you, I hit four for my width and I'm going to hit tab to jump over to the next um, parameter which is my height and I'm going to hit 1.5 and then tab again now in this case I can key in a zero degrees or you see that with my and I'll just zoom in so we can see this a bit better with my um, mouse I can just kind of position this and it'll want to snap to like a 90 degree uh, orientation so I'll just let it kind of snap here and click and that will place that um, 3D or that uh, that sketch there okay so we need kind of a rounded end to this so I'm gonna jump over to my circle now because my plane is locked I shouldn't have to re-lock or, or reposition my plane I should always be drawing on this plane and I'm just gonna pick up on the center point of this click once and then drag up and grab an endpoint here and click again. And what that's done is that's created um, a, a circle that is the same diameter as the width or, or I guess the height of my rectangle. Let's put in that center hole as well. So I'll click here and I'll drag that out and again click to place it. And this time I may want to put a, di uh, a smart dimension on that diameter because I know I want this to be 0 0.5. So once I place that I can click on it and point 0 0.5. Just some tips when you're dealing with dimensions, and this works whether you're in a 2D sketch or using 3D dimensions. Um, if you click the actual number, that will prompt you to change the value. And you can change the value by keying it in, or if you position your cursor over the window, you can kind of roll that, um, roll your mouse to change the value. If instead of clicking on the actual number, I click on the handle, that now gives me two handle points that I can use to kind of reposition how my geometry is displayed. And clicking on the number will position where it is. So that's kind of good to remember because when you get into 3D geometry, it can get a bit busy. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is draw a couple more uh, features in here. So let's just zoom in here. I want to kind of cut away some of this material. So I'll just draw again. I'm not concerned about dimensions. All I'm concerned about is that I've got it on the horizontal vertical and that I'm accurately either connecting to another line or overlapping it. Again, in synchronous, we don't have to be as fussy when it comes to um, locking uh, or, or, or erasing lines, just as long as we've got the general shape somewhere in that sketch. I'm also going to add this piece down here on the side by clicking somewhere on this face down some distance and just walking over until I see it kind of snap to that endpoint. Clicking again and then dropping that line in there. And then I'll right click to end that command. So now, you know, we've got a lot of overlapping sketches and if this was an ordered feature, they wouldn't allow us because it wants a nice clear definition of the profile. In synchronous, it's not the case. I'm going to switch to my select tool, which again is up in this top corner or you can hit escape, or if you're adept at using the right click menu, you can hold down right click, and it's by default situated here at about 10 o'clock. So while holding down the right mouse button, I'm just going to come up to select and right click to release. And I'm just going to rotate out of plane a bit, just so I can see what I'm doing here, because our next step is we're going to take all this geometry and extrude it out to create a 3D feature. So you notice that we got a bunch of different regions here and we actually want several of them so I'm gonna click on one first and then instead of clicking this arrow to kind of start extruding it I'm gonna hit the space bar and what the space bar does is allow me to multi select so I'm gonna go down and I'm gonna pick up on the other regions I wanna add we wanna grab this we wanna grab this we don't wanna grab the inside though because we wanna leave that as a whole okay now I click on this um, arrow to extrude it out in some direction. And what I'm going to do up here, you know, just like in order, this toolbar, which is kind of context sensitive to whatever we're doing, it's got some options. One thing I want to turn on is my symmetric extent. I want this to come out symmetric from the plane I drew it on. And I'm going to key in a distance of one and a half. Just by typing, you'll see it'll type it in there, so I'll type in 1.5 inches and hit enter. So, let's see what we've got. Part of our sketch has been consumed, and you can see it here in used sketches. That's been used up, but we still have some of the remaining lines that didn't get consumed by the creation of this feature. And they're still there waiting to help us out as part of sketch one. I'm going to turn them off for now, because right now I don't need them. And again, we're interacting just with this geometry. Okay, so what's the next thing we do? Well, now let's try sketching on another plane. So 
I'm going to select my circle, and we should have been unlocked from our plane. If you still see the lock button, you can click it to turn it off, or you can hit F3. This time we want to draw on the top face, and you can see as you kind of mouse around, different faces will highlight, and your cursor will snap to that. Now we have a lot more choices uh, of places to draw on. So I'm going to drop, uh, get this face highlighted, and again hit F3 to lock. Now, now you don't have to lock uh, your sketch pen. You can just start drawing, but I find it, especially if you're going to do some complex geometry, it's kind of nice to lock that plane, and then again, Control H to snap us into that view. So I'm going to create this whole cutout here, and I'm going to do that just by drawing a circle in here. And the first thing I'm going to do, I'm just going to kind of mouse over and wake up that uh, midpoint so that when I come over, I'm in line with the center of that. And I'll click once to place that hole. Now maybe some dimensions to finish this off. I want to drop this in here, and let's say we want to make it a 3 8 hole. So I'm going to go 3 over 8, just like you would in an Excel sheet and hit enter. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to establish a distance between the center of my hole, which I can pick up, and you'll see you'll get feedback on your cursor when you grab it, and the end of the um, edge there. So I'll click and place that. And let's make that three quarters of an inch for now. Okay, rotating out of plane and going back to my select tool so that I can grab that region. Now if you have trouble grabbing that region, you may want to use Quick Pick, which you know experienced Solid Edge users will know all about this. Hold your mouse steady and you wait for the little dot 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 and the right mouse click icon to come up. Then click and you can kind of cycle through what you, it is you want to select. And what we're looking for is this region in here. So clicking on that will highlight the region and Clicking on that arrow will create a feature. Now, it's still got me in um, uh, a symmetric extrusion here. I'm just going to reach over and turn that off. And notice that if I come out of the sketch, it'll add material by creating a protrusion. If I push in, and I'll just zoom in so you can see that, it's actually cutting it away. Now, in this case, all we have to do in synchronous is come through the bottom of the part to create that hole. Uh, lots of ways you can do that. You can just make sure you're well clear of the part with that visual feedback. Or you can go up here and adjust some more parameters, like changing our extent option to through next. And what that's going to do is that's going to allow you to pick an arrow, and it'll just punch that all the way through the material. Okay, a couple of things to note in here. Notice that our dimensions migrated with it, so we can use them as handles to change the dimension. And in this distance, dimension. The only thing you want to note is that depending on which side you're kind of mousing over when you click on that number, it will move either the back face of this part or the um, hole itself. So uh, in this case, I don't want to change the back face. I want to move the hole so I can just make sure I'm on that right side. And you can see as, that, as I change that, it's that hole that's moving. Keep in mind, if you pick the wrong thing, you've also got these two arrows. And this is called dimensional direct, uh, or directional dimension control. This is really nice because, you know, basically what you're saying is, yeah, accommodate this dimension by, um, by either moving one face or another. And it'll highlight to show you which face it's making. So lesson in synchronous is that when you're adjusting a dimension, make sure you see what face is highlighted and change it if necessary. Now, I've been rolling around and making kind of a mess of this. If I want to kind of just reset before I get out of this command, uh, undo or control Z is the way to go. If you hit control Z, it'll reset everything and allow you to kind of pick that dimension again. So again, I might click this and adjust it to, um, let's say, uh, I don't know, 0.8. OK, note too that these dimensions are pink. That's because it's inherited it from the sketch, and it's locked those dimensions. And what a locked dimension means is that if I click this face and drag it out, it's going to hold on to that 0.8 dimension and keep that hole where it is. Now that may or may not be what I want, and at any point I can click on that 0.8 dimension and in the same toolbar, unlock it. So with it unlocked, it's blue, and now when I move that face, it'll allow me to do that. We'll do a whole series on dimensions, live rules, and manipulating faces, but that's sort of a crash course for now. Okay. Next thing we want to do is create this cutout here. And let's grab our line command. And again, make sure you're not locked to anything, because we want to highlight this face. And with it highlighted, hit F3 to lock. And then I'll 
control eights and jump into that sketch plane. Now, I'm going to draw starting outside of my part. I'm going to draw a horizontal line, drop down and drag it vertical, and then back again out horizontal, and then right click to exit out of that. Now I want this to be centered on my kind of midpoint because I want this to be sort of a symmetric cutout. So I'm going to use a sketch relationship to drive that. And that's that horizontal vertical sketch relationship. And I'll line it up with my origin here. Something to watch out for with the horizontal vertical relationship is if let's say, I'll just drag this over here. And let's say I kind of drew something more like that. If you look, the midpoint of my line is actually closer to the origin in the vertical rather than the horizontal. So what can happen in this case, and I'll just drag it so I, is that if I do a horizontal vertical relationship between the midpoint and the origin, it's actually going to snap vertically as opposed to horizontally because that's what's closest. So keep that in mind that the horizontal vertical will do whatever's closest. So if that's not what I want, I want to hit undo and I want to click that line and just pull it back a bit so that I got more distance. And now when I do my horizontal vertical, it's dropped in there. Okay, now I don't know this uh, dimension yet and really that doesn't matter. What I want to do, just like we've done before, is rotate out. But this time, notice that I don't have a region to click on uh, outside of this uh, curved face. And that's because my sketch doesn't lie on the curved face anymore. So. Uh, what I need to do is if I want to kind of cut through all that, I want to pick up uh, or use some more commands here. And what we have is we have the extrude command. So if we click that, by default it wants us to select a face to extrude. I'm going to change that to chain. And all a chain means is it means a sketch that's continuous. So you'll see now we can select that whole edge there that we drew. The next thing we want to do is make sure that we're actually removing material and not adding material because we're cutting it away. So I'll click remove. And then it's kind of hard to tell what to do now, but if you read your prompt bar at the bottom, it'll tell you right-click or enter to accept. So I'm going to right-click, and then it's going to ask me to pick the side that I'm cutting away the material. And if you think about this, I want to remove material on the inside of these lines. So I'll click, and then that'll allow me to cut that away. And again, I'll just pull that past this. So now we've got that on as 3D geometry, and at any point now we can click and manipulate this or drop a dimension on any edge and then define the shape. In this case, direction doesn't matter because it's symmetric and live rules, which are down here, will detect that symmetry. Again, we're going to do a whole series on live rules, so don't be too concerned about them right now. Let's make that 0.5. Okay, last thing I need to do is drop another hole on this face here, which is a countersunk hole. Now, I'm not sure if I've got enough space for that, so I'm just going to switch back to my select tool, grab this face, and just pull it back a bit, just until I've created that um, hole and I know that I've got enough placement for it. So last time we did this by drawing a circle and using it as a cutout. This time we're going to, um, we're going to use the actual hole command. So I'll click on a hole command, and by default, it'll always put a quarter-inch hole on the end of your mouse. And you notice that as you kind of, if you're not locked to any plane, as you kind of mouse over these planes, it'll kind of flip orientation to whatever plane you're on. You can even put it on curved faces, which is kind of neat. Uh, in this case, I want to lock to this plane, so I'm kind of waiting until my uh, hole is on the right plane, and then F3, or I can click this little lock symbol to lock it on there. Now, the other thing I want to do is I want to change the parameters of my hole. I said I wanted a countersunk or a counterboard hole, so I'm going to go in here to my options and select from the drop-down menu countersink, and I'll switch that to I want a, a, a 0.25 diameter, but um, or sorry, not countersink, counterbore. I want a 0.25 diameter for my hole, but I want my counterbore depth to be 0.25 as well with a 0.5 counterbore diameter. If this is something you plan on using a lot, remember that you can type a name for it and you can hit save, and now it'll always come up as an available option in this list. So I'll hit OK, and then place that. Now, a couple of things to note when placing um, uh, a hole. If you mouse over endpoints, just like when you're placing sketches, you can kind of lock it to a center point. The other thing you can do um, is, as I come near, uh, let's say, this point here, if I hit E, C, or M, that will slap me to an endpoint, center point, or midpoint. So as an example, I'll kind of bring 
my cursor over to this edge and when that edge highlights hit E and what that's going to do is that's going to place a dimension in there for me so now I can kind of snap it so it's at the middle and then key in let's say 0.5 and then hit tab as my dimension and what that's going to do is that's going to position it exactly 0.5 inches from that edge so that's one way you can place it kind of on the fly the other option is just to drop it in there and then place a dimension dimension after the fact there's kind of no right or wrong way personally I like dropping it anywhere and then using the steering wheel or a dimension to place that with some precision just remember when you place your dimensions to make sure that you're adjusting the right side okay last couple of things to add we need a cutout along the bottom here so I'm gonna draw start drawing a line and again remember if you can't get that if you can't get that plane make sure that you're not locked to that plane you wanna click that to unlock it and let it lock to another plane now in this case I'm gonna start drawing by selecting that bottom edge coming out in this case I haven't gone into my sketch view I'm gonna let my mouse feedback and the crossers on my cursors tell me when I'm horizontal or vertical and I'm gonna drop that in there and then it'll give me a region that I can click on and extrude out now in this case you notice that well what if I wanted this to be uh, symmetric I, I don't think it's symmetric in fact I know it's not because when I click on this solid edge is not detecting any symmetry so a good question people ask is that what if I've gone and created that um, face you know how, how can I make that symmetric and, and there's really a lot of answers to this an easy way to do it is to grab the whole feature and you can see it's listed down here as a cutout And when I grab that it'll grab all the faces that are associated with that now this is kind of a more advanced steering wheel move and again we're gonna cover this in the future but there's my arrow right there if I click once on that center node that allows me to place my steering wheel wherever I want and you'll see it'll kinda of wanna to snap to edges and faces so what you wanna do is you wanna snap it to this edge and as you come along see if you can find that center point there it should highlight up there and then I'm gonna click so I've placed my steering wheel on the center point so what I've actually done here is I've said I'm gonna move these features and this center point is gonna be my control uh, spot and, and what I can do now is click on that minor axis and start a move and that's sliding it back and forth now because I have picked up on the center point all I have to do is find some feature that's on the center in this case the origin and click and place it and what that's done is that centered the midpoint of this onto my origin and what the result of that is now is a symmetric relationship so again good way to move a feature or groups of features or faces you know just grab the faces you can also do this just by multi selecting and grabbing those two faces and then click once so that your steering wheels on the end of your cursor drop your steering wheel onto an edge and then move it along until it kind of snaps to that center point and then you've got a control point that you can use to line it up and any feature that's centered will do you know you can pick up on the center point of this hole for example just make sure that your key point filter isn't set to something that you can't get you know if you were looking for a center point make sure that you've got center point selected okay final steps in uh, in creating this is uh, to put a radius on this face so I'm just gonna click round radii pretty straightforward you click it'll place the radius and away you go now I know that that radius has kinda of come over the uh, um, my face a bit but you know we can move that face down if we didn't want it interfering with that radius and then similar command underneath the button stack is the chamfer and we can click here and chamfer that back let's say just to change that let's say we wanted it at 0.15, 150 thou of an equal setback and now we have chamfered that so with the general shape now we can put dimensions anywhere we want and, and adjust this and you know I, I encourage you to give this a play we'll be going into how to manipulate faces and and properly use dimensions but give it a try you know click on faces use the arrow to adjust them click on multiple faces for example if I grab this face hit space and grab that hole that'll move the two of them together you can also try controlling that by locking dimensions. Lock that distance between the two and now they'll always come along for the ride. 
So this is really the benefit of having a synchronous model now that we can kind of edit it in numerous ways, put dimensions wherever we want. So that pretty much wraps up today's uh, course. I'm going to um, put up the uh, YouTube channel. This is where we'll be posting the link. Everybody will be given uh, the uh, the link afterwards. And uh, Again, you know, we look forward to hearing your feedback on what you want to see in subsequent tutorials.